Evil Islamic Hospital, Medicine, Religion, and Charity, published by Cambridge University Press in 2015, analyzed hospitals as central institutions of the medieval Muslim city that conditioned the city's physical, medical, and spiritual landscape. His second book, Piety and Patienthood in Medieval Islam, published by Rutledge in 2018, examined the pious construction of patienthood in the early Islamic medieval period. And his third book, Medicine and Religion in the Life of an Ottoman Sheikh, also published by Rutledge in 2019, examines the life and career of a rector of Al-Azhar University in the second half of the 18th century, thereby shedding light on the place of science and medicine in Egyptian Ottoman scholarly culture on the eve of colonization. Along with these three books, Professor Raghab is currently working on a further two books. The first, Communities of Knowledge, Science in Medieval Europe and Islamdom, co-authored with Professor Catherine Park, looks at the history of medieval and early modern science across traditional boundaries, separating Europe and the Islamic world, and uses objects to investigate the production of scientific knowledge and practice. The second, Around the Clock, Time in Medieval Islamic Clinical Cultures, investigates the place of time as an epistemic and cultural category in medical thought and practice. It looks at how time is articulated in a variety of contexts, from understanding seasonal variations and astrological and astronomical changes, to aging, to disease progress, and to the place of time in defining gender categories. And I imagine this work is particularly relevant to today's subject. In addition to all of this, in addition to being a historian and physician, Professor Raghib is also a documentary filmmaker, the founding director of the Independent Center for Black, Brown, and Queer Studies, and co-founder of Pinwheel Productions, a film production studio dedicated to supporting Black, Brown, and queer artists and stories. We're very glad to have Professor Raghib joining us today for his talk entitled Against Time, Epidemics and Medical Temporalities from Bubonic Plague to COVID-19 and the last um, roughly 15 minutes. Uh, thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nasser, for this very generous introduction. It, it, will, um, it will last 50 rather than 15. <laughs> but... <laughs> sorry, I meant to say 50. I'm sorry if it came out as 15. <laughs> um, so let me try to um, share my screen here. Um... So again, thank you very much for this invitation, Asad, and for the center for um, hosting this event. And many thanks again to Nasser for this very generous introduction. Um, it's, it's really a delight to be here, and I only wish that it was possible to be in person. Um, well, I imagine it's not a surprise that a historian of medicine is talking about epidemics. So now that I've lost the element of surprise, let me at least assure you that I've been interested in epidemics for some time before March 2019. Almost a year ago, uh, my friend and colleague Keith Whalo explained in a talk with NPR that Black Death um, should allow us to think about COVID and speculate on how it can change our society. Whalo's remarks and similar, are similar to many others, whether within the field of history of medicine or in medical practice. We also contemplate, contemplated how Black Death can help us think about the current moment. Indeed, this cover picture, which I'm using right now, isn't particularly unique. Black Death or Bubonic Plague offer the historical reference for our thinking today, while the 1819 flu seemed like the closest equivalent to COVID-19, plague offered at once a reminder of possible devastation, as well as a hope for a world rebuilt. Of course, plague is not actually a medieval disease. The Democratic Republic of Congo reports some thousand cases annually since 2010. In September 2019, Madagascar suffered an outbreak of pneumonic plague, a more devastating version of plague that is transmissible by droplets. It was particularly difficult because symptoms resembled those of COVID-19, but are significantly more fatal. Moreover, the last plague uh, pandemic continued to, continued to ravage Manchuria uh, as late as 1912 mere five years before the 1918 flu struck. What is interesting here is why plague is seen as a disease of the past. 
In today's talk, as well as in my work, I question the chronological arrangement of the history of medicine within a lexical field centered around modernity and Euro-American experience. This lexicon works to create chronological and geographic boundaries, whereby the elsewhere is also an elsewhere, where the non-Euro-American is often in the past and where the past is almost always non-Euro-American. I want to start my talk then by stating an overall claim that animate much of my work. In his On the Post-Colony, Achille Mbembe differentiated between Aj and Yule. While Aj is a period that is often understood and perceived by its contemporaries, a durée is not simply a chronology, but an entanglement. It does not simply describe a period, but is built on the meaning that is that this period attests to. It attempts to preserve such periodization at the same time. Writing history of medicine within the durée of the modern and Western does not simply describe the here or the now. Instead, it conditions structures of relevance that pushes everything else from colonial and post-colonial medicine to medicine among minorities in the global north to the elsewhere and elsewhere. I will argue today that a critical history of medicine that addresses and takes seriously, seriously the histories of the non-European, the non-white, and the non-Anglo-American populations needs to, and often does, question these temporal boundaries and the assumptions that they create. In this talk, I will look at medical thought and the priorities of medical practice. I will ask how physicians and medical practitioners understood and continue to understand epidemic diseases. I will look at plague, not simply as a moment in the past, but as a constitutive moment in the history of Galenic medicine and its descendant modern Western medicine to understand how it affected medical thought and practice. I will then look at COVID-19, focusing on particular on the Middle East, particularly Egypt, as a case study connected to other places in the global south to analyze how different conceptions of epidemics lead to different and varying models of management. In 1835, Antoine Barthélemy Clot, a French surgeon from Montpellier, who served as the army chief medical officer in Egypt, issued a bulletin to physicians and medical practitioners around the country with instructions concerning the management of bubonic plague. Few cases have been reported in army barracks and the country was bracing for yet another wave of the disease. Klo was a client of the Ottoman Viceroy of Egypt, Mehmet Ali Basha, who was, the lead, who was at the time leading a statewide program aimed at creating a modern army capable of achieving his expansionist dreams in Africa, the Levant and Asia Minor. Clo, along with many other French and Italian physicians, engineers, and officers, were leading the Pasha's efforts. In his memoirs, letters, and various writings, Clo understood himself as another colonial hero pursuing France's self-proclaimed mission of modernizing primitive or backward races and nations. So although he did not serve, as a, serve a particular colonial administration, he saw and presented himself within the ranks of French colonial officers and physicians from Algeria to West Africa to the Caribbean. He was the French doctor of Egypt. Claude's bulletin is interesting at a number of levels. First, it is one of the earliest accounts of public health measures conducted by the state in colonial or proto-colonial context. Second, it does not seem to have represented Clo's own views. In his detailed book on plague in Egypt, Clo explored the various opinions of contagion and non-contagion, siding eventually with non-contagion's view. He considered quarantines to be barbaric measures inherited from the dark centuries. In fact, a painting that still hangs in the Cairo Medical School today portrays Clo injecting himself with pus from a plague patient to demonstrate to his students the falsehood of contagion. Of course, if he indeed performed this deed, he was exceptionally lucky. Yet, despite his staunch anti-contagionism, the bulletin was focused on quarantine and on preventing contagion. This discrepancy strongly suggests that this bulletin was a collective work that represented a political decision rather than one that is made by Clo himself. Third, while this outbreak was Clo's first encounter with plague, local physicians and medical practitioners have seen plague before. Indeed, plague moved on a circular repeating temporality. 
Since its first appearance in the Near East in the 14th century, it has recurred in waves every few years with occasional lulls that would last a decade or two. Plague in this sense was not simply plotted on a long durée, but was rather a semi-constant presence that created a living medical tradition spanning about three centuries. The plague archive was governed by plague's odd and ambivalent temporality. On one hand, plague is an acute condition, developed fast and killed its victims rapidly. Physicians had little time to reflect on the course of the disease in a given patient, let alone attempt to treat it. On the other hand, it was recurrent as an epidemic affecting hundreds of people at the same time and manifesting in rather similar fashion, it was giving physicians more time to think about disease course, except that such course would need to be conceived not within a given body, but rather across many bodies and multiple patients. The Arabic word for plague, uh, for epidemic diseases is wabet, a term that indicated rapid spread and disastrous outcome. Ta'un, on the other hand, referred to plague and also to pupils. Although the two terms were sometimes used interchangeably, authors were very much aware of the difference and of the fact that such usage is only approximate due to the fact that plague was the most important epidemic that affected the Islamic landscape. The unsettled relation between the two works at once interchangeable while clearly different reflects the ambivalent nature of plague itself. Plague or Ta'un was an acute condition that affected a single body that was named after its most important symptom, the bubo. Yet plague as an epidemic was a recurring illness that affected not a single body, but rather the body politic. In other words, plague lived conceptually in the space between the individual and the collective. Epistemologically, it affected the individual, but was knowable in observing the collective. Ontologically, it was a fever affecting one body, but also an epidemic affecting the multitude. The ambivalence of plague influenced medical thought in multiple ways that will survive into the modern and contemporary, as I will demonstrate. First, however, I would like to dive a bit more into the temporal ambivalence of plague as an acute and chronic condition, a disease of the one and the many, and how this ambivalence influenced medical thought and practice. In 1385, Ibn al-Khatib, a physician and courtier in Granada, completed one of the more detailed treatises on plague. It was not the first or the last, but it continued to be cited heavily as late as the 19th century, both in Europe and the Islamic world. Ibn al-Khatib explained that plague was an acute fever that affected the lungs. Acute fevers were not uncommon, but plague fun functioned differently. Ibn Khatib and others explained that fever boiled the blood and corrupted the bodily humors, which in turn affected the body's major organs, lungs, liver, heart, and the brain. In this context, the bubus, the synchrono of the disease, were reflections of the body's attempt to rid itself of these corrupt humors and protect its major organs. Bubus in the armpits, for example, were aimed at protecting the heart, in the groin protected the liver, and in the neck protected the brain. Many physicians explained that plague was also particularly aggressive. The fever developed rapidly and led to fatal pneumonia in a very short period. Moreover, it led to a series of complications such as fatigue and confusion, not to mention that bubos could develop into abscess. Each of these complications needed to be treated separately. The changing nature of the disease rendered its nature as a fever a temporal character. This means that with time, the disease effectively and clinically ceased to be a fever and became a different condition. Plague's temporal character affected its clinical ontology and epistemology. While plague remained epistemologically coherent, known and diagnosed as a singular disease that manifested differently across its various stages of development, its temporal development meant that it became ontologically incoherent at the level of the medical practice. The disease effectively started as a fever, and then the fever ceased to exist from a practical and therapeutic standpoint. The disease was very difficult, if not impossible, to cure, not because of its original ontology as a fever, but because of how such ontology fractured rapidly, allowing the disease to manifest as multiple and different concurrent conditions. This lack of coherence in time 
made it particularly difficult to develop a clear and knowable course of action that physicians could follow apart from the attempt at prevention. In other words, the disease was addressable in a systematic fashion as long as it remained a coherent whole, that is before it actually affected the body. While prevention was a key part of Galenic medical practice, it became more important under pandemic conditions. This is demonstrable in seeing how medical authors across the plague centuries dedicated long sections of their works to prevention. As a disease best understood in the collective, the process of the disease development is also understood differently. Etiology or the cause of the disease is supplanted by predisposition. Similarly, disease progress was replaced by contagion. Predisposition was not a particularly new concept in Galenic medicine. Galenic physicians believed that diseases affected those with complexions or humoral formations closer to the nature of the disease more easily than others. That didn't mean that others were safe. A common example used in medical texts is that of a twig. While a dry twig catches fire rapidly, a wet twig could eventually catch fire. It only would take more time as fire would need to dry it out first. In the same sense, a predisposed person fell ill rapidly. However, in pandemic conditions, the disease exerted prolonged effect on everybody that even those not predisposed may eventually catch the disease. In this view, predisposition was not simply an innate character. Instead, it was a temporal quality, influenced by food, drink, and habits, and can be manipulated as well. As a temporal quality, predisposition was a potential subject for diagnosis, which could help in offering more focused approaches to prevention by making individuals less predisposed to the disease. Diagnosing individual predisposition required careful consideration of the person's health, life, and diet, which was impossible in pandemic conditions. Conversely, collective predisposition became easier to detect. The mass morbidity and mortality caused by the pandemic allowed for regional and communal predisposition to be more easily observable for physicians. This was evident at three levels, geography and climate, age, sex, and race, and living and socioeconomic conditions. Physicians observed that plague spread rapidly in urban or settled areas. Both Ibn al-Khatib in the 14th century and Klo in the 19th century recommended moving to dry and high places with good air circulation and to leave crowded cities, villages, or places close to animal dwellings. Second, age and sex were factors that defined specific groups of people as generally predisposed. It was observed that the pandemic affected children and women more than grown men. A number of physicians explained that this was because of excess humidities in women and children's bodies that allowed for the fever to spread more quickly. Similarly, physicians argued that particular racial groups were affected differently than others. While the conception of race, of course, changed from the medieval into the modern period, medieval belief that white military slaves succumbed to the disease more than others, especially black slaves, survived in views about black immunity in the early modern and modern periods, a point that I'm happy to discuss more in the Q&A. Third, many authors noted that the pandemic affected the poor and destitute more than the rich and well-off. Ibn Khatib referenced their crowded living quarters and neighborhoods, as well as their, quote, lack of knowledge and of hygiene, which helps the disease to spread more among them, unquote. Others also noted that the poor did not have enough food, which weakened their resistance to the disease. Communal predisposition ushered in a new level of awareness that focused on patterns, prompting physicians to document and explain them. Some hired assistants to count the numbers of funerals crossing city gates. Others visited hospitals to observe the sick, while others mentioned that they peered from their window to observe the slowly emptying streets of a crowded city. About six decades after Klo signed the bulletin on plague, the nature of plague will change dramatically. In the last pandemic of 1890s, which killed close to 10 million people, Yersinia pestis would be isolated as the bacteria causing plague. Soon enough, the disease will cease to be the scourge that it used to be and will instead become better known as a zoonotic disease that can affect humans. While the disease's nature changed forever, 
the structural changes that plague brought about in medical knowledge had a much longer staying power. Plague was therefore not an epidemic, but I argue it was the epidemic. As I will demonstrate, these structures of knowledge will be observable in our contemporary handling of COVID-19. On November 24th, 2021, South Africa reported the identification of the new Omicron variant. The samples were collected on November 11th in Botswana and the 14th in South Africa. The variant was even detectable in samples collected as early as November 8th. The most immediate response in the US and most of Europe was to close borders with South Africa. I will be glad to come back to the question of borders in relation to epidemics in the q and A. But for now, I would like us to consider the shock and surprise that accompanied the discovery of Omicron. To be sure, any virologist knew that the virus will mutate. It's just what viruses do. We've also been through three or four different waves, each of which overwhelmed the healthcare infrastructure. It seems reasonable to assume that a new variant and expected development should not deliver the shock that it did to the entire system. While the variant should have been expected, it ran counter to the temporal arrangement of COVID-19. Since it was pronounced as a pandemic, COVID-19 functioned within a logic of waiting, a wait for the summer, a wait for the curve to be flattened, and of course, a wait for the vaccine. The latter was often portrayed as the true end of the disease. Unlike other epidemics, the wait for the vaccine is particularly remarkable in relation to COVID-19. While plague, as we just discussed, functioned around the logic of recurrence, and while cholera, yellow fever, and Spanish flu were also conceived within a framework of repeating and recurring, or as we mentioned, as an acute condition for the individual, but a recurrent and even chronic one for the collective, COVID was firmly placed within the space of the acute, of waiting, and of temporariness. Moreover, the temporality of waiting enabled the logic of scarcity. A relatively short wait meant that all measures taken to control or manage the disease are temporary by definition, ones that do not invite or require any structural revisions or changes. In February 2020, the CDC offered new guidelines for triage and treatment of cases of COVID-19. These triage protocols were meant as exceptional measures to be imposed on top of the Manchester triage protocol. The Manchester protocols aim at defining the severity of a given condition in the emergency room. Patients are assessed rapidly and are given a particular priority in management. The new protocols, however, were meant to deal with a different reality, a new and largely unknown disease that manifests with a variety of symptoms and with a difficult to predict course. Under the new guidelines, triage nurses are to ask patients about COVID's major symptoms fever, cough, shortness of breath, loss of taste and smell, etc. If they suffered from two or more, they are taken to separate space for further assessment. If they are able to breathe normally and their oxygen levels are um, adequate, they are sent home and asked to self-isolate. If their oxygen levels were poor, they are moved to the ICU, evaluated and prepared for use of ventilators. In analyzing these guidelines, we're immediately confronted by the specter of scarcity that hovers over the entire healthcare system, especially in relation to COVID. First, while emergency rooms are supposed to be entry points for emergencies and not for routine care, they have functioned as the main entry point to care for plural plurality of American patients. In the absence of affordable health care, patients often visit the emergency room with a host of conditions that do not constitute an emergency. The CDC protocol, therefore, had to account for cases that do not meet the definition, objective or subjective, of an emergency. Second, scarce testing capacities meant that the protocol had to rely on clinical assessment. The triage personnel, therefore, are tasked not only with assessing whether patients presented with emergency, but also to act as gatekeepers responsible for the preservation of limited testing, te testing techniques, uh, kits, and limited protective gear. The logic of waiting, the inevitability of vaccine development, the silver bullet, provided, for, provided these conditions of scarcity with remarkable staying power. This is an emergency that will go away. 
not a chronic problem in the healthcare system. While the management of COVID in Egypt was also embedded in a logic of waiting for the vaccine, the nature of the wait was different. Here, the wait was not based on trust in technological development. Instead, medical professionals and patients alike understood that vaccines will not be available when developed and that Egypt and other African and Middle Eastern countries will receive the vaccine only after the US and European citizens have been vaccinated. In other words, the question was not waiting for the techno fix, but rather waiting in line for when more worthy lives are protected. In this context as well, waiting and scarcity seem to go hand in hand. Yet scarcity here is produced within the context of post-colonial economy. At the material level, the slow trickle of vaccine supplies follow patterns of global economy of knowledge. South-South channels provided quicker access to Sinopharm or other Chinese vaccines. Yet patients and medical practitioners embedded in an epistemic economy that favors the global North placed the Chinese vaccine at a lower level compared to AstraZeneca, Moderna, or Pfizer vaccines. The governmental management of this scarcity and the resulting hierarchy of options was built on existing autocratic arrangements. The autocratic regime of Abdel Fattah Sisi managed vaccine distribution along lines of clientage. Military hospitals and personnel had their pick. Transnational companies were allowed to import their own supplies counted against Egypt's share to vaccinate their employees and the availability of vaccines followed the traditional privileging of urban centers over rural areas. At an epistemic level, the autocratic management of information created another layer of scarcity. The Egyptian Ministry of Health implemented very strict rules in deciding who can be counted as a confirmed case. This was meant to significantly drive down the case counts and delay the need for any significant measures. Combined with the scarcity of tests, the crowded testing facilities, and the delays in processing tests, government numbers were only useful if multiplied by several orders of magnitude. In other words, as far as patients and doctors were concerned, they were, the numbers were indicators rather than actual numbers. Furthermore, the regime continued to crack down on any attempt to disseminate information through social media. After a video of a healthcare worker collapsing in tears as people died around her in the ICU went viral on Egyptian social media, the government prevented the use of mobile phones in hospitals and instituted legal consequences for leaking information. Much can be written about the politics of healthcare in autocratic context of Egypt. Most recently, works by Sohab Ayumi and Shirin Hamdi provide excellent sources to think about these questions. Building on their work, I want to focus here on the production of medical knowledge and the networks of knowledge production in the global south under pandemic conditions. Egypt, similar to a number of other countries in Africa and the Middle East, had tethered its medical system to the UK and US systems. COVID, however, demanded a different arrangement. In August 2020, authors led by Dr. Abla Mustafa, professor of pediatric pulmonology, at Cairo University, published a review article in the Egyptian Pediatric Association Gazette. The review was titled, Practical Approaches to COVID-19 and Egyptian Pediatric Consensus. The list of authors included chairs of pediatric departments in different Egyptian universities and represented what the authors termed consensus. The review was clear in its intentions. It started, Egypt is one of the lower middle income countries with limited resources, which require a simple and practical clinical guideline to diagnose and treat COVID-19 cases, as well as to protect healthcare workers from catching infection. The proposed protocol relied heavily on clinical signs for diagnosing COVID and proposed the use of tests only as a last resort. This view was similar to other publications. An article in the Egyptian Liver Journal in January 2022 argued that using antibody tests was sufficient as a preoperative screening tool. The authors contended with the inaccuracy of these tests. However, they argued that the difference in accuracy between antibody tests and PCR were low enough to merit their use since they are more widely available. Another article published in August 2021 
in the journal of the Egyptian Public Health Association took the reliance on clinical assessment a step further. Faced with government unwillingness or inability to protect healthcare workers, the authors argued that an assumption of positivity should be based solely on clinical suspicion, even in cases of negative tests. In this context, the reliance on clinical exam to diagnose COVID-19 was not simply a stopgap measure to mitigate temporary scarcity of testing. Instead, it was the principal medical approach. Similarly, doctors in Egypt, Bangladesh, Nigeria, and many other countries in the global south relied on a series of tests and diagnostic tools that were largely neglected in the global north. A key example in this context is the use of CD scan and um, hold on one second. Is, uh, a key example in this context is the use of CT scans and x-rays in diagnosing COVID uh, patients. The CDC panel on diagnosis and treatment guidelines confirmed the value uh, of CT scans and x-rays as tools to diagnose COVID, but they were not added to the regular guidelines in part because of how expensive such investigations are in the US. In Egypt, along with other African countries, however, CTs and x-rays emerged as a key tool for diagnosis. Here, the post-colonial state relied on existing infrastructures, which included at times outdated CT and X-ray machines as cheaper effective options for diagnosing COVID. In Egypt, along with other African countries, however, CTs and X-rays emerged as such key tool, which meant that there is even more expenses, healthcare expenses, as opposed to using the cheaper tests. Another example of how it is expensive to be poor. In the same way, blood tests that do not engage with the viral load were used to diagnose COVID and its progress. For example, Turkish Journal of Hematology published a brief note to the editor on findings in blood picture and peripheral blood smears in COVID patients. The study was conducted in Morocco investigating 146 patients, all of whom showed significant changes in their blood cell count and in the shape of their white blood cells. Similar studies have showed that the levels of ferritin, a blood protein that is often used as a marker of blood iron, also changed with COVID and demonstrate sensitivity to the severity of the condition. Most of these diagnostic markers went through very limited controlled tests. However, they were utilized precisely because they were more easily available. In this sense, COVID management in the global south turned more into an ongoing investigative process that aim to produce a different knowledge base and a different way of thinking about the disease. The development of these protocols relied on different medical and temporal logic. While COVID in the Euro-American context was seen as a unique emergency requiring mitigation until a vaccine is developed, COVID in the global South was plotted on a timeline similar to other epidemics a potentially recurrent condition that will not fully disappear and that requires sustainable and affordable management. The first logic of waiting and crisis thinking emphasized how COVID is different from other conditions. Tests were developed in order to be applied widely and to be as sensitive as possible for COVID. Investigations into new variants were conducted based on virus DNA as opposed to clinical picture. In the same vein, significantly more time and funding was directed towards vaccine development and tests rather than treatment development. In other words, faith in the eventuality of the vaccine meant that COVID could remain a unique, peculiar emergency during which we can hold our collective press. In the Global South, however, thinking of COVID as not as a temporary phenomenon, but rather as another addition to the growing disease burden meant that research and management focused not on the uniqueness of COVID, but rather on how it is similar to other viruses. Indeed, articles discussing blood findings in COVID started with explaining that most viral diseases cause peripheral changes to blood smears. Similarly, other articles explained how ferritin increases were also common in other viral infections, which warranted investigating its increase in COVID. COVID of the global south was not seen as a unique epidemic that required new and different approaches. Instead, COVID's incoherent ontology was embraced as a way to avoid the difficult and expensive task of dealing with COVID as a singular emergency. 
Detecting the virus was becoming less important since large scale prevention was difficult. And since it was possible to detect blood abnormalities, CD scan abnormalities, and other indications of problems caused by the virus, the virus was no longer the target of intervention, it was the disease. Similar to how diagnosis relied on a different logic, one of similarity rather than uniqueness, treatment protocols also developed with a different set of epistemic priorities. The larger and more significant disease burden affecting the population in Egypt, for example, meant that the threshold defining risk, mild or moderate cases had to be different. Medical protocols adopted a much more liberal approach with home management allowing cases that would warrant hospital admission in the US, for example, to remain at home. Lower levels of oxygen saturation were allowed before the need for support. Home oxygen pumps and canisters were prescribed to be used with the help of a local pharmacist, as opposed to being strictly confined to hospital spaces. Conversely, medical protocols exhibited a much more aggressive approach to drug treatment. Keeping more patients at home for longer meant that aggressive drug therapy was profitable to avoid complications. Over the past two years, the Egyptian Ministry of Health updated its protocols five times, the last of which was two weeks ago. Notably, they delayed the last update to avoid the update being understood as a response to Omicron. Again, a question of considering COVID as a recurrent event as opposed to a new uh, and unique condition. In each of these updates, more antibiotics, antiviral drugs, and steroids were added to the list. In October 2021, authors led by Dr. Raga Yait of the Department of Tropical Medicine in Beni Suif University in Egypt published a study in the Journal of Antibiotics showing marginal efficacy for ceftazimide, an antibiotic for the treatment of COVID-19. Ever McTeen of Trump fame was also studied in controlled trials by Dr. Sharif Abd Salam, faculty in the Department of Tropical Medicine in Danta University in Egypt and others. Their study was published in June 2021 in the Journal of Medical Virology. While they attempted, uh, while they admitted that improvement in patients was not statistically significant they concluded that it showed a trend of improvement that warranted the use of the drug, which is indeed on the Egyptian protocol. Similar conclusions were also reached concerning hydroxychloroquine. The studies of Evermectin in particular are instructive. While studies conducted in Egypt and in the US arrived at the same conclusion, no statistically significant result, the interpretation was markedly different. For CDC and NIH, the absence of statistically significant results meant that the drugs should not be used. After all, management was generally less aggressive or drug heavy, and performance was always given to, and preference was always given to palliative support. In Egypt, however, and under a medical approach invested in heavy drug-based management, the statistical trend, albeit not significant, was sufficient to authorize use. Authors were not shy to mention that the drug was cheap and widely available, and for that reason, utilizing these drugs seemed to be the wiser approach. At another level, knowledge about COVID in the Global South circulated in networks and spaces that are different from those used by scientists in the Global North. Unlike research by Euro-American scientists, which is published in major tier one journals, scientists in the Global South opted for using and relying on regional and local scientific journals, many of which are tier three or tier four, and on letters to the editor, which are sometimes not peer reviewed. Moreover, they cited most often not highly circulating medical journals, but peripheral journals, which are specialized in basic science rather than in medicine. For example, the evidence base for ferritin levels relied on articles published in Clinica Chemica Acta, a known journal, but of clinical chemistry, as opposed to major publications in hematology. In other words, the pandemic, as it manifested in a different logic in the Global South, animated also different scientific and medical networks that were able to accommodate a, this different medical logic. In Dr. Fauci's testimony in Congress a few months ago, he explained that the CDC panel did not initially recommend masks to avoid a run on masks. 
Of course, the run of masks happened anyway, as people intuitively sought to stockpile. In fact, when the CDC recommended the use of masks to everyone, different companies, universities, fashion designers, and others got into the mask business, if you will, and masks became everywhere, not to mention a fashion statement. The mask episode is therefore another clear example of the logic of scarcity at work, leading at times to opposite to the opposite of intended results. That is, however, there is, however, another plot twist, if you will. Looking deeper into scientific writings in relation to masking and other measures of prevention, we can see that the delay in requiring masks was not simply an attempt to mitigate scarcity. Indeed, the scientific community in the US and Europe was quite hesitant in accepting the evidence base for full-scale masking, which was coming from East Asian experience with H1N5 and SARS. Face masks were immediately implemented in Japan, Korea, and Hong Kong, leading to significant mitigation of infection. On the contrary, the evidence base for social distancing originated from the 1918 pandemic studies here in the US and was immediately accepted, modeled, and updated. The elsewhere was again an elsewhere. Of course, the hesitation around advising masking may have contributed to the lack of public confidence, and it certainly contributed to rising violence against Asian, Asian American communities. Writing a history of medicine in the theory of the Western and modern, one is confronted with the necessity of breaks, jumps, and major events. Temporal boundaries are erected to emphasize the uniqueness of the modern and the alienness of the past. But writing this history is also an act of moral adjudication. Modernity is not a chronological category, but a racial and moral one. The modern is always white or white adjacent and always good. A brief look at works from Steven Pinker's best-selling uh, writings to, indus to the industry of the quote-unquote West and the rest can give you an idea about the breadth and depth of this space. The history of Islamic medicine is a unique subdiscipline in this context. While often marginalized as belonging to the elsewhere and elsewhen, it offers an episode into the European story, an interlude that links, bridges, and separates the Greek fathers from European progeny. It also functions as a fertile problem space for civilizational narratives, as well as for a securitized discourse that sees Muslims as either brown doctors and engineers, compliant grateful informants, or terrorists realized or in the making. As an episode in this long story of the West, Islamic medicine needs to remain medieval and requires a golden age and a decline. Its importance is summarized in the names that are important in Europe and its contribution. Its med and the contribution of Islamic sciences is measured against European science and medicine. Another glance at publications, dissertations, classes, museum exhibits, and grants funded in the history of Islamic science and medicine will reveal how a majority of these works continue to circle around a series of names most known for European audience, Avicenna, Razis, Averroes, and others. And of course, I'm mentioning their Latin names here on purpose. Even more significantly, a look at projects aimed at digitizing and renovating manuscripts in the Islamic world will demonstrate how these intellectual priorities are transmitted, how the archives are effectively remade to render this story the only one possible to tell. In thinking about temporality of epidemics, considering both plague and COVID-19, I argue that the temporal arrangement of chronic and acute diseases of communicable and epidemic conditions relate less to the biological reality of the disease and more to the professional organizations of medical knowledge and the economies of knowledge production and consumption. Here, my study of plague is located in the space between the study of commentaries dedicated to explaining the nature of the disease from a humoral perspective and the study of the epidemic's economic and social impact. In this middle space, I'm interested in how physicians thought, how they organized their practice and how they approached their patients. Similarly, a serious consideration of COVID-19 in the global South needs to move beyond quote unquote feeling sorry or documenting inequalities to consider the epistemological structures that enable these physicians and scientists to work and develop their own approach. It requires a deeper and more serious consideration of the space of knowledge production and circulation in the global South. 
or at least that's what I hope to do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ahmed, for that extraordinary talk. Um, it, please uh, place your questions in the chat and I will read them aloud. Um, while we're waiting, uh, I will take the privilege I have to be able to ask questions, to ask a couple to Ahmed directly. Um, and this is, um, and this is difficult because many, many questions came up to me in this and they, they relate somewhat to where you concluded, Ahmed, which is trying to understand the, the, the as it were, identity of COVID in different regions. So specifically in the US versus in Egypt. There's a way in which I'm tempted to ask you um, almost a counterfactual as an unfair question to a historian, which is if, for example, the the vaccines were more readily available in Egypt, is there a way to reflect on nevertheless how different the diseases would have been constituted? But to phrase that another way as something less counterfactual, there is in this, my trying to understand in, in, in your presentation better, the ways in which we are looking at two, two separate diseases that place pressure on one another, on their narratives and where that pressure points to the expectation that they should be the same disease. And maybe this is a question too of, of how you said you might recur in, in Q&A to the boundaries of whether or not this is a partly about the relationship between the locality, the localness of, of COVID and its global circulation and how these different logics relate each to each. Um, Apart from those, if I can just take liberty to ask one other, there's a, as you pointed to, there's a sort of narrative in the United States of a kind of overliving with regard to, to COVID, that there should have been the technological fix that hasn't, as it were, been received. Um, and partly because the variants keep disturbing that narrative in a certain way. Can you say, I had a hint of, of the of the kind of counter narrative or the alternative narrative or different in Egypt when you talked about how the question of Omicron wasn't being voiced. But can you speak a little bit more? Has there therefore been no such kind of temporality of overlooking in that context? Because there's already been this kind of embrace of this expectation of recurrence. So those are my questions. Um, I'm hoping we'll hear more in the chat. Thank you so much, Nasser. These are absolutely great questions. So I think, I think you're absolutely right that the identity of COVID is quite different. Uh, from the beginning, we were obviously, we, we encountered um, the disease in a way, the epidemic in a way that we have not seen in other epidemics, which is this kind of confidence and trust in the techno fix, right? While again, the idea of we are now in a position to develop, to develop vaccine is understandable. The notion that it's going to be developed in a year was particularly remarkable. And the idea also that, you know, that we saw from the uh, Operation Warp Speed, that if you can throw money at technology, it will deliver. And ultimately it did deliver. Um, but of course, the fact that it delivered too fast became also a problem with trust. And, you know, now we're, we're trying to, a lot of public health messaging is trying to walk back this and say, well, this, there has been work on RNA vaccines for about five or six years. So what, it, what I'm trying to say here is that from the onset of the condition, there was clearly, as it arrived in different parts around the world, there was a clear understanding of how you want to deal with this. In the US and in Western Europe, there was this kind of, you know, we are now in a position finally to face an epidemic with a vaccine that will be effective and will end it. So there is this kind of also clear understanding of we are in a position to stop vaccines from, from to stop the epidemic from actually being a long drawn you know um, condition of few years in the global south that was not the way um, it presented at all but it presented again in relation to you know just thinking of covid in the same way that people thought about aviary flu 
about swine flu, about SARS, all of which arrived in particularly in Africa, in North Africa, but also in Sub-Saharan Africa, and became endemic. These never disappear. They continue to be there. But ultimately, what are, how are you going to deal with them? It becomes absolutely unnecessary to say whether this avian flu or SARS or COVID or any kind of viral pneumonia. That becomes a luxury, the differentiating them becomes a luxury that it's just not called for, right? So from the beginning, you had this understanding of an epidemic that would just become another burden on this healthcare system. And therefore, you have to deal with it with whatever tools you have. And basically, the idea was, we're going to try to handle COVID in a manner that is business as usual as much as possible. That is at the medical level, right? Uh, at the social level, there were, or at the political level, there were some mitigation. Um, you know, some schools were canceled, were closed at times, et cetera. But at the level of medical thought and medical practice, it was the goal was to keep business as usual because that's the, the only way you can deal with something like this. And yes, that's exactly what happened with Omicron. So while the, the entire world was, you know, getting completely scared, what is going on? Is this the new variant that's sort of going to destroy all the progress we've made? There was significant, obviously, anger at how the vaccines are not as effective, which when you think about it is, is you know, ridiculous because a vaccine against a virus that's effective to 70 and 80 percent is, is gold. It's not even going to stay that. It's more likely it's going to decline to become similar to, you know, flu vaccine, which is in the best of years is 40% effective in preventing infection, but 80% effective in preventing hospitalization. So that was not supposed to be a surprise. And yet again, the frustration is related to the idea this was not supposed to happen. In Egypt, on the other hand, Omicron was, you know, it's like news, you know, doesn't really matter. In fact, intentionally, the Ministry of Health did not want to give the impression that anything is changing or that the new um, guidelines are connected to Omicron, and they are not. They're just simply connected to new studies that they've been doing in different journals and adding more antibiotics to, um, to the list of, um, you know, recommended medications. So, so that's, that's why I'm thinking about this as how the temporality of the disease affects, in this case, medical thinking. And once you receive the disease within a particular frame of mind and medical thought, then that's, these are sort of, you know, the, the results keep coming one after the other, kind of, you know, almost a path that you have to go down. Thank you for that, Ahmed. May I, uh, Nasir, ask a question? Uh, please ask. And, uh, thank you so much for, for this, you know, enlightening talk. I, I a lot of uh, unformed ideas and questions in my mind, so I'll attempt one at this point. So I, I think the main point that I got out of this talk is, as you just mentioned at the end of your last comment, the, the different types of temporalities and the reception of a particular condition in those temporalities, right? So, um, and I think you began your talk by referring to a certain approach to disease. We talked about Ta'un and Waba and mm -hmm. You know, you, you spoke about how fever, a particular fever is a manifestation of something which then fractures into different conditions and then epistemologically cannot be grasped. Now, in all of that conversation about the pre-modern Muslim reception of plague, uh, you spoke up, you know, you, you did hint at, you know, a broader framing of, uh, of the reception of the disease, right? So there is a, a reception of it through Galenic medicine. There's also a theological element that it's coming from God, for example. And that, that produces some kind of a temporality within which mm -hmm. the condition is being received, right? There's a theological and a cultural and a religious and a medical element, all of which is informing how the disease would be received and how one would respond to it. And you also point out, obviously, there is a distinct you know, uh, approach now in, in the global South. What I'm not able to make here is a connection between the two. You didn't, for example, speak about a theological orientation in the current reception in Egypt, for example, perhaps a cultural reception. But it seemed to me rather is that they are still operating within the framework of modern medicine. There is a continuity certainly with respect to how they've engaged other such episodes in the past. And they're not fracturing this moment as an exceptional moment. Um, is there a kind of link you can make 
between you know, the temporalities of the past and how the global south is receiving with, with you know modern medical knowledge at this yeah. moment which is distinct from the, from the north for example absolutely absolutely and i think um i would say it's it's that this particular um epidemic is more distinct um but in general what it, what i'm trying to say here is that the question if you will um that medical practitioners are asking themselves concerning epidemics and epidemic diseases have remained and circulated around similar issues, which is how do you work with a disease that affects people so fast and at the same time that affects, that keeps recurring in a larger population? How do you bridge the gap between the individual and the collective? And in Galenic medicine and in its descendant, um, contemporary Western biomedicine, you have this question or you have this issue of how this medicine has been primarily conditioned around dealing with the individual. So physicians then and now continue to be better equipped to deal with individual conditions than they are to deal with collective um, conditions. And therefore it is not an accident, of course, that a, a whole discipline fractures out of medicine and becomes what we call today public health. I'm not saying that the way we deal with, um, with the epidemics has remained the same, but my larger historiographic point is that instead of thinking about history, a jump in the history of epidemics that happens with germ theory, and that happens with the beginning of our understanding of new epidemics, we need to think about continuities that actually take us all the way back to the first big pandemic that affected and that was faced by um, medical practitioners. So we can trace a long history of thinking about epidemics, of considering questions that are related to epidemics that take us all the way back to uh, plague. And in a lot of these cases, there is this kind of um, dynamic of thinking about the ontology and the epistemology of the disease. Can you name a disease a disease? And when are you able to name a disease a disease? If I have fever, is it fever or is it the flu? And if it's fever coming from a variety of different conditions, does it still remain a coherent disease or is simply, or are we required to separate the symptom from the category of illness itself or from you know, the name disease? So, so that's the kind of first historiographic connection that I would like us to build a larger continuity that takes us all the way to uh, Black Death as the first major pandemic that affects our contemporary all the way to the contemporary. Um, COVID becomes a different condition here precisely because, and in the global north, because of the technofix, because of the idea of the vaccine. So the, while the, because the idea of the vaccine was not available and is not available in the global south in the same way, we can continue to see these same continuities. What do you do with a disease that changes how do you, do you want to make it similar or do you want to make it different? So medieval physicians were thinking, medieval and early modern physicians into the 19th century keep thinking of plague. They want to make plague a fever. Because if plague, if I understand plague in terms of fever, I can deal with it, I can treat it. In the same way that physicians today are thinking about how to make COVID just another viral disease. And therefore I'm able to mobilize the tools that I have. The difference that we have in the global north is connected to this valorization of uh, the technofix. Now, it remains, you know, there will be a next pandemic. We know that because of environmental change. So this is, you know, this is just act one. So are we going to be in the same position next time around thinking again about vaccine being a technofix or are we going to move away from this to try to institute long term preventive measures that people will not necessarily get so frustrated with because of the notion of the vaccine. That is, you know, again, it's, it's hard for a historian to think, to speculate into the future, but, um, but this is the kind of the level of continuity. And, you know, it's following up on, on other work that I've done in relation to hospitals where I was making arguments about the professionalization of the quote unquote modern physician, which in the literature has always been related to um, learning through experience, learning through practice, relying on physical exam as opposed to history taking or uh, more than history taking, et cetera, needs to be traced to the quote unquote 
the rise of Islamic hospitals, if you will, in the 13th and 14th century. And these, these same tropes started there as opposed to started in the 18th and 19th century. Um, so I, I hope this answers your question. I, I have one more thought, but I, I lost it. I, I will try no, it does, it does brilliantly. I think you just uh, were kind enough to make those connections for me uh, that, that had been percolating in my mind. And I was not entirely clear not absolutely clear about how your initial part of your your talk would uh, you know fit with with uh, some of the details that that came after, but this did it. So thank you so much. But please proceed with your next comment. I thought you had. Um, I mean, it skipped my mind, but I'll, I'll think about it and I'll get back to you. It looks like we had a number of people who had to leave. Not not long after you concluded, um, so we're still waiting to see if other people might put in the chat. But I want to. So then, can I um, ask um, one further question? Then this comes from the um, exchange you just had with us. So, so I can understand this better. So, in your talk, when you claimed that the plague was the pandemic, as it were, and you emphasized the the, it wasn't that the the that it's necessarily the case that all, as it were, visions of what a pandemic is um, look to or are cued by that earlier one necessarily, especially not necessarily in terms of responses and such, mm -hmm. but that the problematics that emerge around it are taken forward and we can recognize elements of those problematics, like the extent to which a particular sort of symptomology is, it, it becomes a, an element of the diagnosis or the mm -hmm. constitution of the ontology of the disease and so on, right? So first, I, I just want to, is that, is, can you just expand on that? I want to understand the specificity of that kind of claim and that sort right. of emphasis. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Actually, another comment just came in, but I'll stop there. I, that, yes, you, you're absolutely right. So what, what, I, what I'm claiming here is that um, the, the production of, it, the, if, let, let's put it this way, the pressure that was put by the, the Black Death pandemic, the 14th century pandemic, on medical thought at the time and on the professionalization of medical thought led to a series of changes that survived for centuries to come, even as the nature of the disease itself changed. So with this, we have to reckon with two things. One that we need to think about the pandemic not as ending in the 14th century, it keeps recurring until the 19th century, right? So the last, and you know, it is not, um, the biological nature of the disease doesn't change historically until the late 19th century. So during this entire period of thinking and of um, formulating medical understanding of how to deal with a communicable disease, what are the questions you need to ask, what are the practices that are important? Practices like counting, like um, you know, noticing patterns of affliction, like paying significant attention to predisposition and linking it to larger and sort of you know, um, community-wide um, uh, measures for protection, etc. All of these things are coming from these four centuries of plague, if you will. Right, so that, that's that's the key argument here. Um, so in the historiography, as you know, we're always thinking about the birth of public health is really the plague of Marseille, right? I mean, it's it's like you know they built a wall, that was it. This is this is the birth of public health. But what I'm claiming is actually physicians have been thinking about these measures much for a, for a much longer time. Not all states ended up doing this, and and you know again. I have more to say about, um, to go back to Asset's point about, you know, the theological response, for example, this needs to be understood as also a public health response, right? So, because, you know, if I believe that this is coming from God and then I institute collective readings of the Quran, for example, um, on weekly basis or even daily basis, that is a public health response. Um, but even in the more medical side of things, Physicians are thinking about public health response since that time. The other twist to this 
is that thinking about public health response did not come as independent from the physician's ordinary way of thinking about the disease. It was simply a process of um, replacement. So physicians are thinking in terms of etiology, in terms of symptoms and disease progress, and in terms of treatment. In the same way that they think about etiology, they started to think about predisposition. In the same way that they're starting to think about symptomatology, and disease progress, they are thinking about contagion, and treatment becomes prevention. And in this, if we think about it in this framework, now we can better understand why over the course of many epidemics that happened from the 18th and, or 17th and 18th century till today, we have physicians screaming about the exact same thing. Why are, you know, we have physicians always claiming that measures, public health intervention measures should not be up for debate. When I tell you do this, you need to do this. And I mean, up to the director of CDC saying, I, I don't understand why people are not taking um, vaccines or not masking, which is sort of, people never did that, you know, never listened in this way. But if you put the public health in the realm of the political as a collective action, then debate is, you know, par for course. But if you're thinking primarily in terms of um, a kind of, in terms of a treatment, a prescription, then this is another problem that becomes, you know, what, how do, how do we think about it this way? So, so that's, that's an example of how shifting our way of thinking about the history of public health and link it to um, the development of medical thought, we're able to understand better the development of these measures of public health and also the role of epidemics in general in the development of medicine, as you know, we, which is an, another point. Epidemics are not exceptional conditions that just happen. In fact, if we look at it in a different way, epidemics can be seen as these key moments that lead to serious changes in the history of medical thought and medical practice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ahmed. That was very clear. Um, uh, it looks like we have um, a couple of people um, uh, leaving further. So I think, and no more questions for the moment. So I'm just going to wrap it up. Um, and uh, thank you, Ahmed, for a fascinating talk. Um, Asad, did you want to say something before we conclude? Uh, I think he's frozen, or perhaps. So maybe I'll just conclude it there. Thank you again, Ahmed. Of course, absolutely my pleasure. Thank you so much and for the invitation. Ahmed, thank you so much. And Nasser, thank you for hosting. I, I think I was frozen for a second. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do regret, Ahmed, that you were not able to come on campus, but I hope we will remedy that in the future. Absolutely. We love talking about these things outside the confines of, uh, of uh, Zoom. So thank you. <laughs>